Hello and welcome to Lecture 9 of Type Systems. In this lecture, we're going to talk about classical logic and how we can extend the Curry-Howard correspondence from constructive logic to classical logic. So what we've seen so far is we've used the Curry-Howard correspondence to understand various functional languages. So we've seen that intuitionistic propositional logic corresponds to the simply typed lambda calculus, and if we have second-order intuitionistic logic, that corresponds to the polymorphic lambda calculus. And we've also seen various effects like state and IO, and we've seen how they can break this logical interpretation. And we've also seen how we can recover the logical interpretation by means of the idea of monadic programming. But when I introduced effects, what I suggested was that every kind of uh, effect that we commonly see is either a kind of state effect or a control effect. And so by control effects, I mean things like go-tos and exceptions and threads and things like this. And we haven't seen any of those yet. We we printed some values. We rewrote to some references. We re wrote it. Re bleh loads and stores in memory, but we haven't done any kind of uh, unusual control flow. And in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to see that control operators do have a natural logical interpretation, and they cash out as a, as a way, uh, as a computational interpretation of classical logic. Okay, so let's go back to uh, uh, intuitionistic propositional logic way back to the beginning of the course and what we had was we said okay we have this judgment p is true under some set of assumptions psi and so if p is in psi that is if we've assumed psi then we can conclude that p is true we always know that true it can be judged to be true we can judge P and Q to be true if we can judge P to be true, and we can prove that Q is true. And if we can prove that P1 and P2 is true, then we can prove either P1 or P2 to be true. Like either, either branch of a conjunction is true, if you can prove the conjunct. And to prove an implication, P implies Q, we assume P and then prove Q. And that's implication introduction. And to use an implication, we say, well, if you can prove that P implies Q, and you can also prove that P holds, then you have a proof that Q holds. So that's intuitionistic propositional logic. And I want to point to this is true judgment. So what we're doing is we're saying, I have a proof that this claim is true. Okay, and so if we go on, we can add all the rest of it. We can add disjunction and falsehood, and we can say, okay, if P is true, then P or Q is true. If Q is true, then P or Q is true. So if you think about this, um, if you know P, then obviously you know P or Q, because that's a less precise statement. And if you know that P or Q holds, and you can show that R holds, regardless of whether you assume P or you assume Q, then you can conclude that R holds. Because if it's really P, then we can use this branch. And if this is really Q, then we can use the other branch. And if we have false somehow, if we've somehow proved that false is true, because we have an inconsistent set of assumptions, then everything follows from that. So this is the principle of explosion. So all these uh, things together give us intuitionistic logic. And um, just to reiterate again, the this judgment form says that I have this judgment R and I'm going to show that it's true by means of exhibiting a proof. Okay, so we if we say that everything in Psi is true, then R is true. So now what this means is that our primary notion in intuitionistic logic is we want to prove that something is true. So what about negation? So if you want to show that not P holds, so if, if what do you do? And so what we do is we handle this as a sort of definition. And so we say that not P gets defined as P arrow false or P implies false. And so not P is just an abbreviation, meaning P implies false. And so to refute P means to give a proof that P implies false. 
So, the, uh, so if you think about, uh, if you think about uh, um, reasoning in everyday uh, in everyday life, you we have this notion of a refutation, which sort of is the opposite of a proof. So, if you have an idea and you have a proof of it, then you know for sure that it's true. And on the other hand, if you have an idea and someone refutes it, like maybe they give you a counterexample or maybe they just show that your argument leads to an inconsistency. So if you have a refutation, then you know for sure that the idea is false. And so we can say, well, well maybe we can go and try and treat refutations as a first class idea. So in constructive logic, we encode refutations. We say that refuting P means giving a proof that P implies false. So we can say how maybe we can look for refutations as a first class notion that stands next to proofs. And so what we can do here is we can give a calculus for truth and falsehood. And so what we can do is we can have our propositions and we'll use the standard propositions of propositional classical logic. We'll say we have true, we have conjunction A and B, we'll say we have false, we have disjunction A or B, and we'll also say we have not A. And if this is classical logic, we can leave out implication because A implies B is just the same as not A or B. And so what we're going to do, though, is we're not going to do anything with truth tables or anything like that. What we're going to do is we're going to give a calculus of proofs and refutations. So we're going to introduce two judgments. We're going to say that it, uh, we're going to have a judgment that A is true, and we're going to have a judgment that A is false, and we have a judgment that some contradiction is derivable. And all three of these judgments occur under a set of assumptions. But unlike before, uh, we're going to have two judgment, two contexts. So we're going to have a context which will write gamma for things we have assumed to be true. And we're also going to have a second context, delta, which are going to be the things that we've assumed to be false. So when we try to prove A is true, we have a mix of assumptions where we assume everything in gamma is true and everything in delta is false. So assuming that gamma is true and delta is false, we'll be able to show that A is true. Or for a refutation, uh, if gamma is true and delta is false, then we'll show that, then we'll give uh, evidence that A is false. And if we have a contradiction, then we have a proof, then we have evidence that if we assume gamma is true and delta is true, then these two sets of assumptions contradict each other. And in this calculus, as I said, this is classical logic, so we're going to take negation as a primitive. And implication will get in encoded as not A or B. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, let's talk about proofs. What we're going to do is we're going to say, let's keep proofs pretty much the way we expect. So if we want to show that A is true by means of an assumption, we can say, look in gamma. Gamma are the things we've assumed to be true. And if you find A there, then A is true because we assumed it. So it's sort of like saying, assuming A, A. And if we want to show that true is true, then we're done because true is always true. And if we want to show that A and B is true, we need to show that A is true. And we also need to give a proof that B is true. Conversely, what we can do is we can say, well, if A is true, then that's also evidence that A or B is true. And if B is true, then that's also evidence that A or B is true. So, so far, these rules have looked identical to the rules for AND and OR in intuitionistic logic. And something, the sort of first deviation from that is going to be in the rule for NOT. So if we want to prove that NOT A is true, the way that we can do this is we can say that conclusive evidence that not A is true is by showing that A is actually false. So if we can refute A, then not A is true. Okay, so that's, that's a natural idea. So we're saying not A is true when A is refutable. And that's the first place where we're, uh, where we're moving from the true judgment to the false judgment. And so what are the refutations? Well, let's take a look. There they are.
and this should look an awful lot like the proofs. Let's see what the difference is. So here we have and b. We have a, so here we have the proof a and b is true when a is true and b is true. And now let's look over here. How can we show that a or b is false? Well, we c it's not enough to show that a is false because maybe b is true. And similarly, it's not enough to show that b is false because perhaps a is true. But if we know that a is false and we know that b is false, then we know for sure that a or b is false. And so we can see that there's a symmetry between proofs and refutations. So let's go through these one by one and we'll see how this goes. Um, so for the hypothesis rule, we can show that a is false if we've assumed that A is false. So hypothetical reasoning works the same way with proofs as with refutations, except that you look in a different context. So if A is in the context delta of things assumed to be false, then we're able licensed to conclude that A is false. And um, what we see here is that there's no rule for refuting top. And that makes sense because over here, we said true is always true, which means that there should be no, never be a way of refuting true. And similarly, false should always be false. We don't need to prove that false is false because that's, that's, uh, that's always true. We're, we, false is a sort of self-refuting proposition. And we talked a bit about or, where we said if A is false and B is false, then A or B is false because this rules out the, the chance that the other branch is true. And now here's something interesting. If we wanted to show that A and B is false, well, that's easy because that's easier because we only need to refute either one. So if we know A is false, then we know automatically that A and B has to be false because A and B is saying both A and B. And so if either one of them is false, then the conjunction also has to be false. So if A is false or B is false, then A and B is false. And now let's look over here. How do we refute? How do we give a refutation of not A? Well, the easiest way of doing that is to actually just show that A is true. So if A is true, then not A must be false because obviously something can't be true and false at the same time. And so there's a really satisfying duality here. So when you switch from proofs to refutations, the role of conjunction and disjunction flips around. And the other thing that's not nice is that for negation, all negation does is it says, well, you show not A is false by showing that A is true, and you show that not A is true by showing that A is false. Okay, so that's very symmetric. And so now the question is, are we done with this calculus of cal classical logic? So obviously the answer is no, because I had this third judgment. But like, let's see why we need it. Well, so far, what we've been doing is we've been thinking about proofs and we've been thinking about refutations. And we've said, okay, well, for true, we can prove it automatically. We don't have to do anything. And it's impossible to refute true. And for the connective A and B, we prove it by proving A and proving B. And we can refute it by either refuting A or by refuting B. So we can refute either one and we have a refutation of A and B, but to prove A and B, you have to prove both of them. And symmetrically for false, there's no way to prove it directly. And to refute it, we don't have to do any work. It's automatically, uh, it's automatically refuted. And again, symmetrically, to, to prove A or B, it's enough to prove A or it's enough to prove B. Either one works. But to refute A or B, you have to refute A and you have to refute B. This sort of closes off either, either avenue of escape. And the nice little bit of symmetry is that for not A, its proof is a refutation of A, and its refutation is a proof of A. So not sort of swaps the roles of proofs and refutations. And I said this is 75% of the way to classical logic, so what's missing? Well, what's missing becomes obvious when you try to do some proofs. So if you wanted to prove that A implies not A, well, that's not too bad. 
So what we want to do is we want to show that assuming A, we want to show that not not A holds. And how can we do that? Well, we can apply the not proof rule, and that says, well, what you need to do is you need to show that not A is false. Well, how do you refute? Well, we, this is a false, so how do we refute it? Well, not A is refutable when A is true. And to prove A is true when we have it as an assumption, well, we can just use the hypothesis rule. And this tells us that assuming A, we're able to show that not not A is true. Okay, great. But in classical logic, A and not not A are equivalent, and we can't go in the other direction. So if we assume that we not not A is true, and we want to show that A is true, then we're stuck. We've got no rule that obviously applies. So our proofs and our refutations are mutually recursive, but we have no way of using this assumption. So we have an assumption of not A, and we have no way of turning it into a refutation A. Okay, so what can we do? Well, let's look at some more things we can't prove, and then maybe what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to find one mechanism that'll handle all of these at once. Okay, so here's another thing that we can't prove. So if we assume A and B is true, how can we prove that A is true? So again, we know for sure that this is valid, even in the simply typed lambda calculus. So you can show that A and B implies A by saying, well, if you give me a pair, I can take the first component. And that's fine in the simply typed lambda calculus, but we're not in the simply typed lambda calculus and we can't derive it here. And the problem is we can't use our assumptions or our hypotheses in a non-trivial way. Like, we can use them directly, but there's no way to do work from them. And so, the thing we have is we can start with the idea that proofs and refutations we've set up to be perfectly symmetrical with one another, and this suggests the idea. So, that to refute A means to give evidence that it's false. And this is also how we prove not A. And if we show a contradiction from assuming A is false, we've proved it. And so if we can show a contradiction from assuming that A is true, we've refuted it. So what we're going to do is we're going to say we weren't able to use our hypotheses in a non-trivial way, so let's fix that. And so what we can do is we can say if we've assumed A is false and that leads to a contradiction, then A is true. And if we assume A is true, and that somehow leads to a contradiction, then A is false. Okay, so that's, that's, that makes sense when we talk about it in English, but this leaves a question, how do we actually establish that something is contradictory? Well, just think about it in terms of English. Um, something is contradictory when it's both true and when it's false. So if we have a proof of A, that A is true, and we have a refutation of A, that A is false, then we're in a situation where we have a contradiction. And so that's our judgment for contradictions. In fact, it's the whole judgment of contradictions. And so now, with this judgment, this contradiction rule, um, and these rules that let us uh, um, move from assumptions to, uh, to proofs, what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to prove things like double negation elimination. So the thing we got stuck on was we had nothing to do when we saw A true. We've assumed not not A, and we want to show that A is true. So what can we do? Well, we have no other rules to apply, so the only thing we can do is apply, appeal to the contradiction rule. So it says, well, tr um, assume a, that A is true and try to show a contradiction. Okay, so we've assumed not not A, and we've assumed A, what, what can we do? Well, one thing we can do is we can look for a contradiction, and let's do a con look for a, a way to prove that both not not A is true and that not not A is false. Okay, proving that not not A is true is easy because we've assumed it's true. So not not A is in the true context, the context of true hypotheses, and so therefore it's immediately, it's immediately true. But if we want to show that not not A is false, we can use the 
the refutation rule for not for negation, and that says we have to show that not not that not a is true. And again, we can use the 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 mechanism for proving that a negation is uh, uh, is is provable, and that's by showing that a is false. But look, we assumed that a is false, and so we were able to show that double negation elimination holds. And this idea of reasoning from a contradiction will also let us prove the entailment that a and b entails a. Okay, so what do we do? So we want to show that uh, that well, where to go? Yeah, here it is. That that from a and b, a is true. And we have nothing we can do with a is true, so we'll try to use it to derive a contradiction. So we'll assume that a is false and look for a contradiction. How can we do that? Well, we need to find a contradiction, and we need to. that means we need to choose some proposition to prove is both true and false. So what can we choose? Well, let's choose a and b. We happen to know that a and b is true, so it's easy to show that a and b is true. And the trickier half is to show that a and b is refutable. So how do we refute a and b? Well, we can refute a and b by refuting either a or refuting b. And if we choose to try and refute a, a, we need to show that a is false. And look, over here, we assumed that a is false. So we were able to show that a and b entails a by using a contradiction. And symmetrically, what we're able to do is we're able to show that if a or b is false, then that entails that a is false. And so you can see that the proof looks almost exactly the same, except that we're going to switch um, and and or and true and false. So we move a and b, we, instead of assuming a and b is true, we assume that a or b is false, and we're looking for a proof that a is false. And we do this by means of contradiction, and our contradiction uh, uh, formula is a or b. So it's easy to show that a or b is false because we've assumed a or b is false. And we want to show that a or b is true. And how do we do that? Well, we can do that by trying to show that a is true. And what do you know? What, get, what can you see? a is exactly what we assume to be true when we start, when we set out to prove this contradiction. Okay, so how can we use this? Well, this is this means that now that we have our notion of reasoning from contradictions, it becomes possible to prove things like the law of the excluded middle. So the law of the excluded middle says that A or not A is always true. And how can we prove this? And the answer is by contradiction. So we assume that A or not A is false, and we look for a contradiction. And the contradiction we look for is that not, uh, a or not is a or not a itself. We're going to show that a or not a is false, and we're going to show that it's also true. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, this side on the right, we're showing that a or not a is false. That part is easy because what we've got is we've got an assumption that a or not a is false. But on the other hand, we want to show that a or not a is true. So what will we do? Well, we can we have, we can either try to try to prove a, or we can try to prove not a. Let's choose not a and see what happens. And now to prove that not a is true, we need to show that a is false. And so we need to show that from a or not a, we can uh, be, uh, assume to be false. We can show that a is false, and that's exactly what we did on the last slide. So now we've established that the excluded middle is derivable in this calculus. And so the recipe we followed with intuitionistic logic was we started with intuitionistic logic, and then we said, let's give it proof terms, and we'll get a programming language. So let's do that again, except now, instead of proof terms, we also need refutation terms too. So. So our true context is no longer a list of propositions. It's a list of variables and their types. So we're saying that x 
is a value of type A, or a, um, and we're going to say that U is going to be a co-value of type A. It's a, it's, it's a variable standing for a refutation of A. And so our values are going to be units, pairs, left and right injections, and a constructor I'm calling not. And so recall that we prove not A by refuting A, and so what not does is it says not of K is a proof of not A. And we're also going to include a contradiction term. And we'll see the typing for contradictions in a moment. The interesting thing though is that for continuations or refutations, we can refute false. So I'm going to write in square brackets for a refutation of false. And I'm going to write k comma k prime for a refutation of a or b, where k will be the refutation of a and k prime will be the refutation of, uh, of b. And we'll also have two refutations, um, first of k and second of k. And so we'll see their types in just a moment. And for contradictions themselves, a contradiction is a proof and a refutation at a particular type. And we'll write that as E bar K, at the type A. Okay, so let's look at their rules. So the proof terms will look normal. So we'll say a variable X has the type A when X colon A is in the context gamma of variable of, uh, of, uh, of value variables. The unit value has the type uh, true, has the type top true. Um, e comma e prime is the introduction form for pairs or conjunctions. So if e is a proof of a and e prime is a proof of b, then e comma e prime is a proof of a and b. And if you have a proof e of type, of type a, then left of e is of type a or b. And if E has the type B, then right of E has the type A or B. And we can show that not A is true by means of the proof term not K, where K is a refutation of A. And so now we can do our symmetry trick again and get the refutation terms. So if we've assumed that x is a refutation variable or continuation variable in delta, then that suffices to say that that suffices to refute the, uh, the type A. And we have this empty square brackets as our continuation or refutation of false. And if you know that A is false and, K pro and B is false, then you can pair up their refutations to get a refutation of A or B. And here we're going to say that if K is a refutation of A, that's enough to refute A and B because we can say the first, the first branch of this conjunction is refutable because we've got K. And similarly, uh, if K is a refutation of B, then second of A is a refutation of A and B because we know that K refutes B. And finally, we can refute not A by giving it a proof E of the type A. Okay, and so the thing I glossed over a little bit are the contradictions. And so we can show that uh, E K at the type A is a contradiction if E has the type A and K is a refutation of A. So if we have both a value and a refutation of type A, then we've got our contradiction. Okay, and so the other rule for hypothetical reasoning says that we know A is true if we assume that we have a refutation of A and that leads to a contradiction. And similarly, we know that A is false if we assume that A is true and that leads to a contradiction. Okay, so now we have proof terms. What can we, how can we actually get an operational semantics for this language? And the answer is we will have a set of simplification rules for contradictions. So if we have a value e1 comma e2 and a refutation first of k or continuation first of k at the type a and b, that is going to step to the contradiction e1 uh, matched against k at the type a. And symmetrically, if we have an e1 e2 and we have a refutation second of k, well, we can, 
we know that k is a refutation for b, so and we know that e2 has the type b, so we can reduce our contradiction to a simpler contradiction. So you can see that this a and b became an a, and the first rule of this a and b became a b in the second rule. So all our reductions are simplifying the type of the contradiction. And so if you have a contradiction at the type a or b, then you'll have a left and a pair of continuations, or you'll have a right and a pair of continuations. And in either case, you throw away the tag, and then and you throw away one of the continuations, and you're left with a value and a continuation at a smaller type, either A or B, depending on which branch of the tag that we took. And for not A, for the negation type, that's also very easy. So if you have not k as your value and not e as your uh, continuation, then you, it's easy to simplify this to e at type k. So the value and the continuation just sort of switch roles, and then the type goes from not a to a. OK, so what about the rules for the hypothetical reasoning? And there are two of them. So if our value is really hypothetical reasoning from a from a contradiction and we see that we assume we have a refutation of uh, of a uh, of of the type a and that's our value of type a and then we have a real honest continuation of type a then we can just substitute k for u in c so k has the type refutes a and u is a variable of the type refutes a, so you can do a substitution. And symmetrically, if your uh, continuation says, well, assume that x says a is true and then give a, uh, a contradiction, then what you can do is you can say, well, if e has the type a, then you can substitute e for x, and now you get a new contradiction, c. And so you can see that each of these rules is doing a little reduction. So it's a sort of stack machine where things get pushed and popped off the stack. And there's one issue that came up, though. So over here, we gave two rules for how to deal with contradictions. So we said, well, if you have a contradiction for to get a value, or you have a contradiction to get a continuation, you can, uh, you can substitute something in for the variable. But what happens if both of these are reasoning via contradiction? So, so which rule wins? So do we substitute mu x dot c prime for u, or do we substitute mu a dot c for x? And what happens is that different choices of the priority correspond to different evaluation orders in your programming language. So we've got two rules that can apply, and we have to make a choice. And the choice that we make corresponds to setting the evaluation order for the language. So we didn't talk about this at the beginning of the, of the course because the simply typed lambda calculus is confluent. So yeah, that's a fancy way of saying that the evaluation order doesn't matter. You'll always reach the same value in the end. And so we just ignored this question for reasons of time. And so unfortunately, this is no longer true in the classical calculus because the choice of whether to substitute um, mu u dot c for x or mu x dot c prime for u can lead to totally different answers. So the evaluation order matters a lot in the classical calculus. And if we want to investigate this further, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to do some meta theory to establish the properties of the uh, classical calculus. And so this is actually a tremendous nuisance because we have to prove substitution and we have to end up proving six substitution theorems. We've got two contexts and three judgments, so there's two times three or six lemmas. So you have to show that if he has the type A, then you can substitute it in any judgment for a value variable of the type A. 
And symmetrically, if k is a refutation of a, then you have to be able to substitute it for uh, for the for a refutation variable uniformly across those three judgments. And that leads to six lemmas. And since you have to prove weakening in exchange first, that's actually 18 lemmas. So none of these lemmas are in the slightest degree difficult, but you have a lot of them to prove. Um, so now we can take a step back and say, what have we done and what is it for? So what we've done is we've introduced a proof theory for classical logic and all the expected tautologies of classical logic hold, and we have a decent enough meta theory, but it looks totally different from the simply typed lambda calculus. In fact, if you squint at it a bit, it ends up looking nothing at all like a uh, lambda calculus, but rather a lot more like a stack machine where you're pushing and popping things off the stack in order to do work. And what we're going to see in the next lecture is the relationship of this stack machine to what's called continuation passing style. And this is where we're going to get, like all, we're going to harvest all of the programming examples from the classical lambda calculus. And so I hope to see you next time. Thank you very much.